just um, please have a, have a think about this question, because later on you're going to have to talk to each other about this question. Shocker, talking to each other in church. So just have a think about this question. We've been learning about the kingdom of God for six weeks now, and later on I'm going to get you guys to reflect on what we have learned so far. So, um, yeah, have a think about that. Okay, here we go. So, good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Claire. Um, I'm the one that was faffing with the mic just then, and I'm the minister here at Queensview Baptist Church, for those of you who don't know me. Lovely to have you in person and online this morning. Um, I know it's the start of half term here, so we might be a little bit lighter on the ground today, um, as you get two weeks half term in Nottingham. Fancy, very nice. I would have quite liked that when I was a teacher. So today we're going to spend some time worshipping God through music. We're going to spend time praying together. Um, we're going to spend time specifically thinking about our frontline contexts and um, the places we spend most of our time. And we're going to spend time looking at the Bible together as we continue our series on the kingdom of God. Um, but before we get all to all of that, something much more exciting, the notices. Yeah, woo. Okay, so um, our first notice comes with a question, really, and hopefully a slide. Um, on our preferences here. So, tea and coffee. I'm interested to see what the survey says. If you prefer tea, you can put... Oh, yours, yours is different to mine. If you prefer tea, you can point to that direction. If you prefer coffee, you can point to that direction. If you just like everything, you can just sort of, like, point in the air and wave around. So, three, two, one, tell me your votes. Three, two, one, which way do we go? Oh, OK. So yours, is like I say, it's reversed. Oh, okay, so quite a mixed bag. I'm tea all the way, personally. I like it very strong, Yorkshire tea, decaf, though not much milk, just so you know. Great, okay, well, it looks like, though, all of us enjoy tea and coffee. I wonder why I'm asking you this question. Hmm. Well, we are hoping to restart doing refreshments at the end of the service together. Um, it'd be a good chance to chat together a bit more, enjoy a cup of tea and coffee. I'm not promising you any fancy lattes or anything, but we'll, we'll try our best to make a decent brew. Um, but we need more volunteers. We've got a few volunteers, which is brilliant, but we don't want them to expect to be, do it every single week. So if you could help out and serve on the tea and coffee rotor just even once a month, there is a sign-up sheet at the front, and we'd love it if you could pop your name on, and we'll be in touch and let you know. Um, so another notice was last Sunday, it feels like longer than that, but last Sunday we had a prayer and vision evening, and I just really want to thank you for those that came um, and gave your feedback. Um, it was really good. We spent time imagining together what the church here could look like in the future, and we had some great ideas and sort of common themes came out. Um, we as a leadership team sort of been reading through what you'd written for us, um, and we're sort of processing that. Um, we're going to have a day away together, uh, sort of at the start of November, but another date for your diaries is Sunday the 21st of November. We'll have another prayer and vision evening here. And again, that's open to anybody who feels like this is their church of any age. It was great to have some younger people with us, actually, at the last one. Um, and on that theme of younger people, um, our children and youth work, we are hoping to really fully restart our children's and youth work. Our youth work is um, happening. What groups out with Sally today, is that right? Brilliant. So you'll be going out a bit later. Watch from your queue from Sally. So that's our work for 11 plus. But we haven't yet restarted our work for children under 11 as we're still trying to work out the best way forward. We've had some brilliant volunteers step forward and we're just trying to think about how we can work together. Um, but we would learn, love to hear back from you if you're someone who's under 18 or a parent of an under 18 year old. So you can chat to me. Um, or also, there are some sheets at the front here which just says, you know, what are your ideas? And we just love to hear from you. What do you think would work well here? Um, whilst we're not having um, separate children's work at the moment, there are some sheets and colours and pens. There's loads of different activities basically down there. If anyone under 18, or not, I guess, wants to come and grab a sheet to do join the service, you're very welcome to do that. And there's loads of pens and colours, so please do come and help yourself to that. Um, and please do be praying for us as we work out what the right thing is for our children and young people. We want this to be a place where everyone can grow and flourish of any age. Um, and we really want to make this, this to be a place of fun for our young people, where they really want to come and they're making friends and they're growing in what they know about Jesus and what they know about themselves. So please be praying for us as we try and work that forward. So we're going to spend some time singing together in just a few moments, but I wonder if you've ever thought about why we sing in church. God commands his people to sing a lot in the Bible. It's quite a big feature. I'm just going to read some verses from Psalm 96 along that theme. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. 
his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So God tells us to sing, but why? Now, scientists now know that singing and music do something very special to your brain. When you sing, it connects way more parts of your brain together than when you simply speak. Music has the power to connect our emotions and memories in a way that singing, speaking simply doesn't. That's why I can remember all the words of a song I heard 20 years ago, but still can't remember some of your names. And that's why, um, you know, actually people with dementia and Alzheimer can often still remember songs really well, but struggle to remember other things. Music touches our emotions in a powerful way as well. And I think that God knew that when he told us that singing together is a good idea. And there's also something powerful about singing the same words together in unison. Or almost unison, not all of us are brilliant at following the tune, and that's okay. God loves our joyful music, even if it doesn't sound perfect. I'm sure it's still pleasing to him. You know, sometimes you might arrive at church ready to sing your heart out. It's been a great week. You've got lots to be thankful for. But other times you may arrive feeling not so ready to sing. Perhaps things are hard for you at the moment. Perhaps you've, you know, you read the words of the songs declaring God's goodness and faithfulness, and you're struggling to see that in your own life. But that's when singing together has a real power. It's an act of faith. We declare God's goodness and faithfulness over ourselves and over each other despite our circumstances. Sometimes people talk about leaving your problems at the door when you come to church. I really don't believe in that because I think all you do then is pick them back up when you leave. Instead, we come as we are, whatever we're facing, good stuff and bad stuff, and we bring all of that, our whole selves to God, our celebrations and our struggles, and we declare the truth of him. We fix our eyes on him again. We remember that he is king and it changes our perspective on the things that we're facing. So however you're feeling this morning on this grey, wet, rather miserable morning, let's worship God together now in song. You alone are home. 
here for you this morning, Lord. We are here to fix our eyes on you once again, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're here to praise you as our king. We're here to recognize that you are the Lord of lords and king of kings. And we're here to hear from you, Lord. We're here to listen to you. We're here to learn from you. We're here to explore your word. We're here to have our hearts changed. We're here to come back to you um, in confession and repentance and in faith, Lord. We thank you, God, that it is such a privilege to be able to come together and worship you together as your church family. It may not always feel like that on a wet, miserable morning when we're dragging ourselves here through the rain, but it is an amazing privilege to be able to worship you, to be able to worship you freely and without fear of persecution when we know many of our brothers and sisters around the world do not enjoy that freedom. Lord, however we arrive today, we thank you that you want to meet with us and speak to us. You want to change us. You want to equip us and empower us for the week ahead. Thank you, Lord, that you aren't just here when we come together on a Sunday, but you're with us every step of the day, every part of our week. But Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and encourage one another as your people this morning. Amen. So last month, we introduced a new uh, slot to our service called This Time Tomorrow. Um, and uh, we're just going to watch a little video about that. Just give the tech team a minute. There's lot, I've given them lots to do today, so we'll just give them a sec. They're just going to find a video for us. And then after that, Davey is going to come up for us. So great. Thank you. Ten hours a day. Six days a week. Whenever I'm needed. Every Saturday morning. I spend my time. In a place that matters to God. With people that matter to God. My front line. In the stresses. Successes. Problem solving. Tantrum resolving. <laughs> Laughter. Teamwork. Jokes. Tears. Boredom. Tension. Cups of coffee. Cans of coke. God is working with me. He helps me see what he sees. Put here by God. He knows the day ahead. This place is rich with possibilities. This is my front line. I'm just going to invite Davey to come and share with us. So when we talk about our front line in these, in these sort of sessions, we're thinking about the places where we serve God the most, the places where we are, spend a lot of our time. So we're interviewing a different person each month to hear about their frontline context and how we can pray for them and people working with them. So in case you don't know, this is Davey. Hi, Davey. Um, so Davey, where will you be this time tomorrow? OK, this time tomorrow, I will actually be at home, but I will also be at work because since... Um, March last year, I've been working from home. Hey, fun times working at home. And what will you be doing in your work? Okay, so I work for a software company called Nerve Centre that supplies software to the NHS. I've only started working there two months ago, so at the moment I'm spending a lot of time training, just learning the software. I think tomorrow is actually the first time they're going to let me loose on a customer Ooh. system. So Ooh. I'm going to be configuring a real customer system tomorrow for the first time, so I'm actually quite excited about that. <laughs> it's a good job to pray for you then. <laughs> i probably pray today, for the customer, one. really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what are some of the challenges and some of the joys in the job that you do? I mean, I work in the IT industry, and one of the challenges is actually a joy in that it is just constantly changing the, the technology that we're using 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, is completely obsolete now. So you're constantly having to learn new stuff, um, which I absolutely love. Um, so that, that's a challenge. Another challenge is actually the whole working from home challenge. I don't like working from home. Um, 
And I am really grateful that I have a job that allowed me to work from home because I know I was in a position that was so much better than so many more people. And I, I really am grateful for that, that when the pandemic struck, we just scavenged the office for everything we could and all moved home and carried on our work as normal. But there's a lot of stuff you miss when you work from home. The so the informal chats with people when you go to get a coffee or if you eat your lunch together and stuff that Zoom's great for meetings and getting stuff done, but it's actually not that great for um, getting to know people and like personal stuff about them. So I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge at the minute is finding ways of interacting with people, getting to know my new colleagues without having as many face-to-face -face meetings as I normally would have starting a new job. I'd expect to know people a lot better by now. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, I've, there's a few people I've chatted to recently in the church. I know that the working from home thing, I know for me, when I first started working from home, it's, it's a big shift when you used to be around people and it can be a real challenge. So you're not the only one I know who feels like mm. that. So how can we be praying for you and people who work in sectors like you? I think, I think you need to pray for a lot of people really struggle with working from home. Mm -hmm. um, they, not in terms of doing their job, but just the, the emotional side of it, not having that support of colleagues. If, if someone's struggling, people don't always say it straight away. So, I mean, that's, at the minute, I don't feel that particularly for me, but people in situations like me that have been working from home for the last year and a half and have no immediate prospect of going back into their offices, mm -hmm. Um, it's the emotional side of working from home, I think, you need to pray for, that they can get the support they need and actually realise when they need help and stuff and put their hand up and say, look, I'm struggling here. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, not particularly for me at the minute, I'm in a new company, learning a new job. So, so for me, it's just that I can cope with the volume of new stuff that's coming my way at the minute, because it is um, overwhelming at times, but yeah. in a good way but still probably best for, for the patients who use our software if I get it right. <laughs> yeah. I, I can also empathise as someone who's also recently started a new job. Just the volume of everything when you're having to learn so much, it just, your brain gets quite tired out in lots of ways. So mm. yeah, it can be quite a challenge just to take that all in. That's great. Well, if you work in a similar sector, you, oh sorry, something else you were going to say? No. no. If you work in a similar sector, so IT support, or if you are working from home, um, and you also recognise some of that struggle and invite you to stand. And we're just going to pray for anyone who's working in that sort of sector or anyone else who's working from home. We're going to pray for them in our church and just pray a few other sort of prayers around this issue. So feel free to stand if that's you. If not, that's fine. I know there's a few people who aren't here today. Um, but yeah, we'll just pray together. Yes, Lord, I want to um, thank you for David and what he shared this morning, Lord. We thank you for his new job. We thank you for the provision um, of a job, Lord, um, and the way that he is able to serve you in this context. We pray for him, particularly in the newness of that job, Lord, that you would um, help his brain take everything in, that you would give him wisdom in his decision-making, that you would help him make those connections with people. Um, and we pray for anyone else who's been in a situation where they're changing jobs or um, in a new job, that you would just help them to find their place and settle in um, into that role, Lord. We pray for him, um, especially tomorrow, as he takes on a new thing and he's let loose. We pray that um, you'd guide the work of his hands and that he would make good decisions and that there would be, um, he would be able to pass on a blessing from his hard work. He would pass on a blessing. And, you know, many, many patients will have no idea that Davey, who Davy is or what he's been doing behind the scenes. But we pray that the work of his hand would continue, would continue to pass forward and would bless other people um, in the NHS, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray for all those we know who are working from home, whether that's by choice or whether that's sort of something that's had to happen, Lord. We recognise that it can be really difficult to face long stretches of time on your own um, and um, without other people to sort of have friendship and community with. Lord, we pray for those who feel lonely in their roles um, working from home um, or just lonely in their workplaces for whatever reason. We pray, Lord, that you would build friendships um, and community and companionship, Lord. We pray for those who perhaps are struggling but don't know who to reach out to, that you would provide the right person, a mentor, someone to walk alongside them, um, to help them in their, in, not just in their workplace, but also in them as a person, Lord. Um, and Lord, we just want to remember as well um, that we are grateful. Those of us who have jobs, we recognise that some people are struggling to find work or may not be able to work due to health reasons. 
And Lord, we pray that you would be the God of provision, that you would provide opportunities for work for those who need it, and that you would help them to find the right place. And for those who are struggling and not able to work at the time, God, would you provide all they need financially, with food, housing, whatever it is they need, Lord. And Lord, this morning as well, we also want to remember the family of Sir David Amos, who died this week doing his job. Um, Lord, we recognise that this will have been an incredibly traumatic event for many people, for those who were there and witnessed um, the attack, um, and for his family and friends who have suddenly lost someone very important to them. And Lord, for the whole community who is reeling from the shock of this event. Lord, we thank you um, that David was a person of faith. We know that he was very devout in his faith. We pray for his family, Lord, as, um, yeah, Lord, that they would just know your closeness and your presence, Lord, that they would know your compassion and healing, God. We pray for his church family as they would gather around his family, Lord, that they will be able to offer support and wisdom and care in all the different ways that that's needed, Lord. Lord, we pray for those involved in investigating what has happened, God. Would you give them wisdom? Would you give them discernment? Would you help them find the truth of what's happened? And Lord, we pray for other MPs around our country today who are nervous about going to work and feel worried about how to do their jobs well when faced with threats, Lord. God, we pray for your protection. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your courage. We thank you for those who serve in this way, Lord, and we pray that you would bless them. Lord, we pray for anyone who feels scared in their job, whether it's because of threats, whether it's because of being forced to work in a certain way. Lord, we pray that you would bring freedom where there is oppression, that you would bring safety and protection, Lord, where there is that fear. And Lord, for each one of us here, as we go out into our frontline context tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day of the week, we're all in completely different places, in completely different stages of life, but you know the context that we're in. And we trust, Lord, that you want to use each one of us wherever you've called us. Help us to be a blessing to all we meet. May we be your hands and feet in the way that we serve others or the way that we speak, the way that we encourage other people. And give us opportunities to speak of you with our colleagues and the different people that we meet this week. Wherever we are, Lord, help us be bringers of your kingdom. Amen. 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 Thanks very much, Davy. Thank you. Round of applause. So we're going to think a little bit more later on about the kingdom of God and what that might mean in our context. But before we do that, we're going to spend a bit more time um, in song worship. So I'll just hand us over to the band.
let's just spend a moment in quiet. Just reflecting on Jesus. We've sung a lot of words about Jesus this morning, about who he is, the way he taught us to live, what his death, resurrection means for us, the freedom that he has brought, and the call he makes to us that all our lives should be focused on him. Lord Jesus, we could spend all of our lives singing worship songs to you and it still would not be enough. We cannot describe you fully in your beauty and your majesty. We cannot fully express our gratefulness to you for all you have done for us and continue to do for us. Just as we start to grasp it, we realise there's so much more to who you are and what you have done. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are Lord of my life, that you're Lord over this church. I thank you for your faithfulness to me and all the ways I can see that you have walked with me through my life. I thank you for your patience with me, that you have stuck with me when I have gone off in the wrong direction. I thank you for your grace and forgiveness, that when I come back to you, you always welcome me with open arms. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that you are the head of the church. This is your church. You are in charge. We thank you that you will guide us and show us the way forward. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are a God who speaks. You are not far off and distant. You come close to speak to us. As the sheep know the shepherd's voice, so you speak to us and guide us. And so as we come to your word this morning, as we're going to look at passages all about you, Jesus, would you have your way? Would you speak, Lord? It's not about me and my words, it's about you being glorified, Jesus. It's about each one of us understanding more about who you are and going away from here, more equipped to follow you in our everyday lives. So come, Lord, have your way, speak to us, change us, transform us to be more like you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. So, way back in September, feels like years ago, a lot's happened since then, way back in September, the first Sunday of September, we introduced our new series on the Kingdom of God, and we read some verses from Mark chapter 1. Oh, hopefully. Ah, there we go, brilliant. So we read these verses from Mark 1.15. The time has come, he said, that's Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So we said in that first Sunday that we weren't just going to dive straight into this passage, but that when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, the people who were listening understood what he meant. They understood the background context. Everything that had happened before in the history of the people of God helped them understand what he meant when he said, the kingdom of God has come near. So we have spent the last six weeks digging into that background context on the kingdom of God. We've looked at lots of different stories, different people, different passages. And I just want to give you a moment to reflect on what we have learned so far. So um, normally I would do the recap, but actually I'm going to get you guys to do it with each other this morning. So you may want to think about some of the characters we've looked at, some of the passages, But what do we mean when we say the kingdom of God? What is God's intention for the world? What was his intention for the kingdom? What are some of the things that have stood out to you? So I'd like you to turn to a few people near you and just have a chat about what you've learned. Now, if this is your first Sunday with us, this might be a bit tricky. You are welcome to say, I don't know, I've just arrived. That's absolutely fine. And hopefully someone else in your group has been listening. If you literally, none of you have been here, just introduce yourselves, have a little chat, and that's fine. But yeah, if you just turn in maybe twos or threes, however you are, and just talk about what you've learned so far about the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, off you go. And if you're on Zoom, you can maybe type it in or just chat to someone who's watching with you. Great, so quite a lot of talk there. Hopefully that means you've learnt lots. Or you were just talking about who was good on Strictly last night, you know, one or the other. But, you know, hopefully you were talking about the kingdom of God and what you've learnt. I thought there was lots of good dances on Strictly last night, personally. But anyway, there you go. 
Um, so hopefully, yeah, you were talking about lots of different things because there's lots of different things that we've learned and maybe the images there might help. We've talked about how God is king and he's the one true king compared to no one else can compare. We talked about how his intention for our world is one of abundance and blessing. We talked about how in God's kingdom there is no conflict between people, but there is peace between people and people flourish and thrive, all people. This isn't a message just for one person or one type of person. This is a message for everyone. And for our hearts, that God calls us into covenant relationship with him and calls us to follow him. So today we're going to explore a bit more coming up to Jesus. What did he really mean when he talked about the kingdom of God? And the first thing to say then is that he says it's good news. Now, depending on which Bible translation you're using when you read this passage in Mark, it will either say good news about Jesus or it will say the gospel. And that's because the word gospel means good news. It's the same thing. So in the Greek, it's euangelion, which is how we get the word evangelical or evangelism. It's about people who share the good news. That's where that word comes from. Um, And in the Hebrew, in the the language of the Old Testament, um, the equivalent word is basar. And these two words are linked to the idea of news, but not just any old news, like who won the football or anything like that. These words are specifically linked to do with royal news, a royal proclamation declaring victories or new babies or deliverance and that kind of thing. So, for example, in 2 Samuel 18, King David is fighting a battle with his enemies and a messenger arrives and says, Good news, Basar, for for my lord the king. For the Lord has delivered you this hand from the hand of all who rose against you. And in 1 Kings 1.42, after the death of David, the people anticipate the good news, the Tsar, of the announcement of a new king. So this word's always linked to do with kings and royalty and that kind of thing. And this word also appears in Isaiah 52, which we actually looked at last week. We looked at the later part of Isaiah 52, but before you get to that part... Um, there's this declaration and here Jerusalem lies in ruins that's kind of the city of the people of God and all seems lost but a prophet declares how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings and proclaim salvation who say to Zion your God reigns so in the midst of despair good news is proclaimed and then just a few verses later Isaiah unpacks what that good news is as he talks about the suffering servant king who is going to be sent by God. And we looked at that a bit last week. Then when you move to the New Testament, we talked about that Greek word, euangelion, because the New Testament was written in Greek. And around this time, the Romans pretty much ruled everything or everything in the known world to the Israelites, certainly. And this word euangelion was used by them as well. It was used by Roman emperors to make proclamations they would make good news declarations, telling people how wonderful they were and announcing all their victories. So actually, it's very, very deliberate that the gospel writers choose to use the word gospel in their writings. They're making a statement that what they're writing about is a royal proclamation. The real king has come. Never mind these emperors who like to talk about themselves and big themselves up. This is the real king. The real royalty has arrived. And the word gospel then became sort of the shorthand for the four books that were written about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're known as gospels. That's another way that word is now used. And nowadays too, the word gospel is often used to mean a summary statement of the Christian faith. If someone shares the gospel, we often mean that they are talking about the fact that Jesus died, that he came to earth as a, he came to earth as a human before he died, he came to earth as a human, that he died, that he was raised to life. And through his death and resurrection, we receive forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. And you may have seen these kind of images used and different summary statements used to summarise the gospel. And that is good news. And it is pretty central to what we believe as Christians. We're doing a um, baptism course at the moment. And we've talked about what are some of the key things that you need to believe that sort of make up our Christian faith. But when Jesus came... Back then, in Mark chapter 1, when he first arrived on the scene and he declared good news, he didn't say, good news, in three years' time, I'm going to die and be raised to life, so just hold on till then, because that's when the kingdom comes. And the gospel writers don't just write about Jesus' birth and then his death. No, the gospel is all of his lives and teachings. 
And right at the start of Jesus' ministry, we see signs of the kingdom at work through Jesus. It's not just about what happens through his death and resurrection. There's so much more to it than that. And if that's all we focus on, we miss out so it's just so much amazing stuff in the Gospels that were written for us. So we're going to read Mark chapter 1 together and we're going to look out for signs of the kingdom that we can spot. So the beginning of the good news or gospel about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased." At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news, the gospel of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening... After sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went out to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone, don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter the town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. 
So I realise that's a long passage, but there's lots of different signs of the kingdom there, and I wanted us to be able to see the big picture. So as we've been thinking about the kingdom of God, I've often summarised it using four symbols. They're not on the screen right now, but I wonder if you can remember any of them. Anyone? A heart, yeah, there was a heart, yeah. A world, yeah, that's two of them. A crown, yeah, and... Oh, that was on the other one, but there was another one about all of you. People, brilliant. Okay, so we're going to think through those four areas of the kingdom of God and what that summarises and what we see here in the gospel. So firstly, what does this passage teach us about God, about who is king? Well, as we've already said, the gospel writers deliberately used the word gospel and other language to make it sure that we understand that Jesus is king. Now, Mark doesn't deal with the birth of Jesus. Mark's like the fast one. He's like, I haven't got time for this. Boom, boom, boom. He's always rushing around. Like, there's, a, there's an urgency to the way that he writes. But you can read more about the birth of Jesus in Luke and Matthew. In Luke 1, when Gabriel is telling Mary she's going to have a baby, he says to her, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And in Matthew, when the Magi, the wise men, arrive, they ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw, we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. So in Jesus' birth announcement, it's made very clear that he is king. And we talked last week about someone coming who was going to sit on the throne of David. Jesus is that one. He's a descendant from David. But now, 30 years later, how is Jesus' birth announced? Well, it comes through John the Baptist. Perhaps an unusual choice. Normally, if you're making an announcement about a king, you have a big parade and lots of celebration. And here we have John the Baptist in his camel out, camel you know, outfit and a bit wild and a bit crazy. But John the Baptist comes as a prophet of old. Just like the prophets came before in the Old Testament and said, come back to God, come back to God, turn to him. John comes talking and calling people to a repentance back to God and talking about someone even greater who's going to come after him. But really, you know, so far this is all talk. Anyone can say, oh, this baby is a king, or that guy is a king. But really, we know when someone is a king or a queen through the authority that they have. And right here at the start of Mark, Mark makes sure we understand that Jesus has authority. First of all, he has authority over sickness. He heals a leper, he heals one of the mums, he heals lots of different people. All these different people are coming to him, and he is healing them. Now remember, sickness and death came into the world as a result of sin. Way back in Genesis 3 when we looked at that story. Sickness and death was never part of God's original plan for the kingdom. But rather they were consequences of the curse of sin when people turned away from God. But Jesus has the authority to reverse those curses. Only the one true king can do that. And he repeatedly, not just in Mark chapter 1, but throughout the whole Gospels, will bring healing and restoration to people time and time again. And Jesus also has authority over spiritual powers, impure spirits, as they're called in this chapter. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's no fight here. There's no struggle to see who is more powerful. Jesus simply speaks to the spirit, tells it to leave, and it does. I don't know if you remember, when we looked at Genesis 1, we talked about how other religions at the time um, had different beliefs about their gods and creations of the world, and how often those narratives about the creation of the world involved huge battles between good and evil, and, and the gods had to fight against the evil gods, and it was a struggle, and who was going to win? But then in Genesis 1, God simply speaks, and things come into order. He simply speaks, and darkness turns into light. And here, Jesus all he does, again, is speak. Only God has an authority like that. Jesus is the one true king, and he speaks with authority. And as he speaks, people are healed and set free. Our God is in the business of setting people free. Remember the story in Exodus, where God brought his people from slavery in Egypt out into freedom? 
Bringing freedom is a sign of the kingdom, and it's a sign that God, the true king, is here. We looked at other kings like Pharaoh, and we saw how they used their kingship and power to oppress others and to control others and to gain power for themselves. But here, Jesus uses his kingship to bring blessing to others. Way back in Genesis 12, God promised that all the world would be blessed through Abraham and his descendants. And here now, Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, is blessing others straight away. And that blessing is made available to all. The kingdom of God has a king and his name is Jesus. He is good and he is a loving king and he has authority over all things. The kingdom has come and it is good news. Jesus also has authority over the physical world. So we've already mentioned sort of physical healing for people and we see that a lot in this chapter. But he also demonstrates his authority over the physical world in different ways. It doesn't really appear in Mark chapter 1, but if you skipped ahead a bit to Mark chapter 4, you would see the story of Jesus calming the storm. And if you don't know that story, I'd recommend going and reading it. But basically, Jesus and his disciples, remember, they're experienced fishermen, they should feel chilled out on the water, they get caught in a huge storm and they are terrified. Jesus is asleep and they're absolutely petrified for their life and they wake him up. And all he has to do to that storm is say, be quiet, be still, and the storm is calmed. Now remember, we've heard stories about dangerous waters before. The deep abyss, the chaos waters, the to home. In Genesis 1, that was the disorder of the world was in the to home before God created order. In Genesis 6, the to home, the flood waters, covered the world and destroyed everything. In Exodus 14, Pharaoh and his army are destroyed and taken over by the Tahom, the chaos waters, when they were trying to recapture the Israelites. So the waters, the Tuh- this deep abyss, that chaos, represents something that can't be controlled, represents the physical world. And here in Mark 4, all Jesus does is speak to those waters and everything is calm. Jesus has authority over the physical world in the same way that God demonstrated that in the early chapters of Genesis. And when we looked at how God created the world in Genesis 1, the word that came up again and again and again is good. It was abundant. There was more than enough. It was full of blessing. And when God made covenants with his people to lead them to a land in the Old Testament, it was a land of blessing and abundance, a land of milk and honey. And again, in the physical miracles of Jesus, we see that abundance and blessing. If you think about the story of the feeding of 5,000, Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and feeds over 5,000 people. And there's stuff left over at the end. It's not just a little bit that everyone has. There's more than enough. And when Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding, it's not just any old wine. It's the best wine they've ever had. God's kingdom is one where the physical world is in order, where there is no more chaos, and when there is blessing and abundance. And we see that happening with the arrival of Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near, and it is good news. And then we think about people. What does this chapter teach us about people? Well, way back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God created people, and he gave them a role, a purpose. He called them to care for the earth and be fruitful. They were his stewards, his representatives. And here in Mark 1, we see Jesus calling his first disciples, giving them a fresh purpose and a role. They will be fruitful or fishful, as they are fishers of men. Jesus is king, but he's not a far off and distant king. He lives alongside his disciples day to day, sharing his life with them, sharing his meals with them. And he's training them up. And over time, he gives them more and more responsibility to carry the message of good news to others. He teaches them how to live. He teaches them what the kingdom of God is really supposed to look like. He does this through parables, stories. And we're going to look at a few of the parables over the next couple of weeks that specifically focus on the kingdom of God. But he also teaches them through sermons and talks. Sometimes in a synagogue, sometimes in a house, sometimes by a lake sometimes on a hillside, formal settings and completely informal. One of his most famous famous sermon series is known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's recorded in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. 
And here, Jesus really teaches what that upside-down kingdom is like. Instead of an eye for an eye, instead of seeking vengeance or justice in that way, he teaches forgiveness. He teaches that we should treat others how we would want to be treated. He teaches us about loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. He teaches us about being peacekeepers. He teaches us how to pray. And if you want to know more about what the kingdom of God should look like, I'd really encourage you to go away and read the Sermon on the Mount. It's inspiring, but also incredibly challenging. The kingdom of God is one of forgiveness and grace and love and patience. And we're called to demonstrate that kingdom to the world. But Jesus didn't just teach about the kingdom through his words. He didn't just teach about loving others. He demonstrated it. Look who he is spending time with. The fishermen, they're like lowest of the low. The sick people, the poor, the sinners. This is an upside down kingdom, remember. Jesus isn't interested in spending all his time with the rich and the powerful. No, far from it. He came to serve others. And even think about that last story at the end of Mark 1, at the healing of the leper. You know, someone with leprosy was cast out from society from risk of sharing infection. They had to leave their friends and family behind. They couldn't be near anyone. They couldn't touch anyone. No one would have hugged or touched this man for years and years and years. And those of us who lived in lockdown alone have a little taste of what that was like, and it wasn't very pleasant. But this guy has put up with this for years and years and years. And when Jesus heals him, he doesn't just say, yeah, be healed. Jesus reaches out and touches him. This is a king full of love and compassion. This is a kingdom of love and compassion and peace and wholeness, shalom. The kingdom has come near and it is good news. So finally, we think about the heart then. And the heart really, I've been using the heart throughout this series to think about what's our response, what's, what's the relationship between us and God. In Mark 1, 15, Jesus says, The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So the first thing that Jesus says after declaring the kingdom has come is repent. We talked about this word repentance in our baptism class on Thursday, actually. The Greek is metaneo, and it comes from meta meaning, um, it's it's to do with like changing your mind, that's what it means. But we're not only talking about changing our opinion, about gaining facts. Repentance isn't just a cognitive brain thing. We're talking about a change of heart, a change of life, a change of position, a change of direction. This should be a change that changes your life. You know, the disciples left their boats and followed Jesus. Their lives were completely changed. Once they recognized him as king, their lives were different. They became bringers and builders of the kingdom of God. Not perfectly, they made some mistakes, but they were still learning and they were following Jesus. They belonged to his kingdom. And Jesus invites all of us to repent and come into his kingdom. He's invited all of us to follow him, just like the disciples. It's a journey of learning, a journey of change, a journey of adventure. It can be a journey of hardship and struggle sometimes. But it's a journey from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's one where we become kingdom bringers in our words and our actions. And again, We don't always get it right. We make mistakes, of course. But when we do, we come back to Jesus, we repent again, we change our minds, we change what we're doing, and we ask his forgiveness. Because we're all still learning. And I want to come back to that question I asked you at the start. I asked, what have we learned so far? But let's put it in the present tense. What are we learning Repentance is about a change of mind that affects the way you live. And surely learning is the same thing. As we learn new things, it shouldn't just change the way we think, it should change the way that we live. Just as repentance isn't just about a head knowledge thing, I don't think learning from the Bible should be like that either. You know, we can come together on a Sunday morning and we can learn some more facts about the kingdom of God, Maybe we're making connections about how the big story fits together in a way that we haven't. Maybe we're even picking up some new Greek or Hebrew words. Brilliant. All of that is great. 
But if that's all we're doing, are we really learning? Are we really being changed? Are we really being disciples? If all we're doing is increasing our head knowledge, but our lives aren't different, have we really made God king of our lives? And believe me, I need to hear this too. I spend hours locked away in my study writing out these sermons. But if it's not changing my life, then what is the point? Later on in John, Jesus says to his disciples, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. And then later on, James, and the brother of Jesus, when he writes his book that's in the Bible, he talks about Christians not to be just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So let's not just be learning about the kingdom of God, let's be living out the kingdom of God. Let's truly live as God is king. Let's hear the challenges that Jesus makes to live in a different way, an upside-down kingdom. Let's love our enemies, serving others, seeking peace, forgiving one another, putting others first. Let's make Jesus king in all that we do. Let's make him the centre of all that we do. And then we'll really see his kingdom come. We're going to sing a song together now, so I'm just going to invite the band to come up. But as we sing this song, I just want to encourage you, maybe there's some repentance that you need to do. Sometimes we have an idea that you sort of repent once when you come to Jesus and then that's it. But if repentance is being your mind being changed, then actually the Bible talks about your mind constantly being changed, about our minds needing to be renewed. We always need to come back to Jesus to change our perspective, to go, actually, God, what are you saying to me? Where do I need to change how I live? Where do I need to learn something new? So maybe just spend this song reflecting. It'll be different for each one of us. But is there some area of your life that you need to repent and make God king? Is there some area in your life where you need to make sure that Jesus is at the centre of what you're doing? Thank you.
Yes, Jesus, we want to declare once again that you are King, that you are Lord. We want to make you Lord over every aspect of our lives, Lord. Jesus, we repent of the times that we don't make you King, when we turn away, when we get distracted by other things or make our own decisions. Jesus, we repent when we don't live as bringers of the kingdom, when we don't follow your teachings, when we don't demonstrate the kind of love that you demonstrated to us. Jesus, I thank you that you offer forgiveness and grace, that when we come to you and repent, that you bring us back, Lord, that you receive that forgiveness, you see that confession with forgiveness and grace. And I thank you that we can come to you freely um, at any time and talk to you about what is going on in our lives. I thank you that when you call us to live as bringers of the kingdom, when you offer those challenges that can be really hard, that you, that you promise to walk alongside us, that we're not on our own, Lord, that we're called and you are with us by our side, but also you call us as a family to encourage one another, to stir, spur one another on, to help each other as we seek to follow you. Lord, wherever we are this week, help us to be bringers of your kingdom. Show each one of us, Lord, what it is you're challenging us to do. Show us where we need to submit our lives more fully to you and give us the courage and strength to do that, Lord. Amen. Amen. Just take a seat for a moment. I want to leave us today with a challenge. We're only spending three weeks in this series uh, looking at the Gospels during this series on the Kingdom of God. We are going to come back to Mark's Gospel. In fact, we're going to spend three months looking at Mark's Gospel, walking through that Gospel together from January till April, so you can look forward to that. But you don't need to wait until we're looking at it on a Sunday. You can dig into the teachings of Jesus any time. And it's not just about what you're hearing on a Sunday morning, it's about what you're learning from God for yourself. So I want to encourage you, why not dig into Matthew or Luke or John this week, or get started on Mark and get a head start ahead of us in January. And I was chatting to someone actually last Sunday about reading the Bible and how sometimes it can feel a bit hard to read the Bible. Perhaps you read a passage and you're not sure what it means, or you're not sure what the application is for your life. So here is a tool that you could use. And it's based on something called Discovery Bible Study, which I'm a big fan of, and the images that we've been using every week in this series. So here's one way you could read the Gospels for yourself. Pick a passage of the Gospel, read it, and then ask yourself these questions. What does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about the world or people? And then what is God asking me to do in response to this passage? Sometimes that'll be really obvious. Sometimes you'll need to take a bit longer to think and pray about that one. But actually, guys, that last question is probably the most important. But only if we actually go away and then do it. I really think we learn by doing. You learn what forgiveness is by having to forgive somebody. You learn what loving someone is when you have to love someone who isn't that easy to love. We learn as we go out and obey Jesus and obey his commands. I'll pop these questions and some other resources for digging deeper into these things on my email that I send out each week. Um, if you don't get the weekly emails and you want to get them, chat to me and I'll pop you on the list. Um, and, but yeah, just really encourage you to take away, um, the takeaway from here really today is to go away and dig deeper, to eat the word of God, get into those gospels and see what difference Jesus wants to make in your life and how he wants to bring the kingdom in your life. Just to say that this morning there isn't any prayer ministry available this morning. Many of our prayer ministry teams serve on lots of other rotors, so they're all engaged elsewhere this morning. But a reminder that the healing rooms does run on Thursday. And if there's anything that you want to pray through more in depth, whether that's something of repentance, something about kingship, something that just you need freedom for, we've talked to sung a lot about freedom today, then I'd really encourage you um, to come along to the healing rooms on a Thursday. But finally, let's just close with a prayer of blessing. Yes, Lord Jesus, once again, we just declare that you are king. And I pray for each person here today, online, listening later. Lord, would you be king in our lives, Lord? Would you show us your ways? Would you equip us with all that we need to be bringers of your kingdom? Would we be obedient just as the disciples left their nets and immediately followed you? Would we be quick to follow and quick to obey? Would you give us the words to say to bring your kingdom? 
Would you help us to show your kingdom in the way that we live our lives? Would you be close to us, Lord, as we walk through the joys and struggles in our week, in our frontline contexts, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities? Would we know your presence with us as the King of kings and Lord of lords, but also a friend? Would you bless us this week, Lord, so that we can go out and be a blessing to the world? Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hope to see you next week. And really encourage you, get digging into the Gospels. There's some amazing stuff in there.